Okay, we're continuing our turn two of the play test of the Kaiser's fleet. And just as a reminder, many of the ships you're going to see in the video are still on the order of appearance cards. It's much easier to use those, and this way it keeps your counter clutter down on the board. And I'm using these squadron markers instead. Um, so in turn two, the French, the Italians, and the Russians will now become active. So we can flip those up. And they will now enter the fray. And that's going to change the whole situation. The Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and the Baltic. So we'll continue on and uh, we'll see how she goes. Okay, the turn begins the reinforcement phase. And we have a whole host of new ships. We've got, what, three, six, seven new dreadnoughts for the British. Five new dreadnoughts for the CP, two more for the Italian fleet, and we have a new U-boat flotilla introduced. So I'll place those on their home ports, and we'll see how she goes. Okay, the next phase is the mutual repair phase. Now the German Empire here is capable of removing eight hits from their ships, so they can easily remove the hits from the Helgoland and the Oldenburg. And as I mentioned in the previous video, the best way to keep the game fairly clean is to put them back on their charts on the uh, force board. So we'll move those back on. Now the British are capable of removing 10 damage points. So they have no problem removing these. These three ships. And we'll put the Lion, the Indefatigable, and the Princess Royal back in their task force boards. Again, keeping the game fairly clean. All right, so the next phase is the EP movement phase. Now I'll make some decisions and we'll pick up the video after I've moved the Entente powers for turn two. Okay, this is after the EP have moved their units, but before the CP has reacted. We've got the 2nd and 1st Squadron in the North Sea. I put the 3rd and 4th Squadron in the Dogger Bank. The 5th Squadron, which only has two ships in it, into the channel. And the Bellerophon is going to attempt a bonus move. Over down in the Mediterranean, moved Indomitable into the Azores. The French were not too successful in moving their fleet. The French, Italians, the Hungarian surface ships, and the Russians have to move by die roll. They need a five or six to move. So only the France moved into the Western Mediterranean. But that relieves the uh, battle cruisers British here to do, do other things. So the Inflexible moved into the Eastern Mediterranean and the Invincible will attempt to move into the Aegean. In the Adriatic, the Leonardo da Vinci sailed and the Tijahov for the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire. So we've got some action there. Um, oh, actually, this sh should have been done only in uh, the CP phase, so I'm a little bit out of phase there. I deployed the uh, British submarine into the Baltic, because they're anticipating some German ships are going to go in there, and uh, we'll see how that turns out. Okay, so now we're going to do the CP movement phase, and I'll video that after they have moved. Okay, the CP player has moved. He's deployed U-boats into the North Sea into the western approaches. The first and third squadrons moved into the Heligoland Bight, the second squadron into the Baltic. And the scouting squadron we're putting directly on Great Britain. This means that they're going to do a raid. Now there's special rules for raids, but if the um, CP player does raid the British coast, the British are allowed to take their third squadron, the battle cruiser squadron, if it's in the Dogger Bank, and put it on top of the CP squadron, which means they're going to be a, a battle to see if the, the raid works. Gobin is going to take a chance. She's going to run the mines when she does her bonus move and try to get into the eastern Mediterranean or the Aegean. It is risky, but risk is the name of the game for the CP player. So we'll catch the action after I've done the bonus moves for uh, actually both sides. OK, 
Okay, well that turn didn't uh, go so well for the um, CP player. The poor old Gobin, in trying to run the mines, got the worst possible result. She rolled boxcars, which sank the Gobin. Well, it serves her right, I guess, for being so bold. And to see nothing but my bad luck. Anyway, um, the Centurion made it into the Western Approaches. The Bellerophon failed her role. And we're going to have a couple of combat situations. We're going to have the Tijaha fighting the Leonardo da Vinci. And we have this raid to resolve. So I'll do this battle between the Leonardo da Vinci and the Tijaha. And then we'll resolve the raid and the uh, submarine attacks. Okay, the small battle between the Tijahoff and the Leonardo da Vinci. Each are rolling four dice each. Okay, no hits by either side. And both players decide to tough it out and go for a second round. Second round. That ain't too good. Two hits on the Leonardo da Vinci and one hit on the Tijahoff. Okay, so that's the result of the battle after the second round. So the Leonardo da Vinci must break off because she has one less hit than her defense value. So she is removed from the board and goes back to Italy. Now, since the Tijahoff is damaged, she also has to go back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You're not allowed to keep damaged ships at sea. Okay, now we have to resolve the raid here between the 3rd Battle Squadron and the Scouting Squadron. And I'll set the ships aside, and we'll show you how that works. Now, I didn't mention that um, if the British Battle Squadron had not been in the Dogger Bank, or if the EP had decided not to counter the raid, you'd automatically be giving the um, CP player one victory point. Most of the time, you'll want to put your third battle cruiser squadron in the Dogger Bank to intercept such raids. So, we do have a battle. And raids are just fought like a normal battle, three rounds. And if the British do not drive the CP player from the battle, the CP player would get two victory points. So it's very much in the interests of the British here to fight this battle out and drive the uh, CP from the field. So they don't want them to get two points. Now that on the CP's side, he doesn't want to stay to try to get the two points and get so damaged that his ships are useless. So we've got a very interesting situation here. Let's roll the dice down the line and see who wins this battle. Notice we've got the strongest EP ships on the right and the strongest CP ships on the left. Again, if you're playing in a two-player game, the ships would be oriented thus. But for the video, so we can see what's going on, we'll do it this way. So I'll pick up the video after each ship is fired. Notice the indefatigable can fire on the blucher. Poor little uh, cruiser, which in real life got sunk. I forgot to mention this little wee fire marker I uh, invented. All you do is put that behind your line so you know where the devil you are when you're firing. So right now the Sadlitz and the Port Royal, or Princess Royal, are firing at each other. We'll roll the dice and see what they get. And yikes, the CP inflicted two hits on the Princess Royal, which also means she's going to have a break-off marker put on her. So what you do is just move your little fire marker down so you know that these two ships are firing. So let's continue the action after everybody's fired. Well, that was an interesting round. As in real life, the Blucher got sunk. She can only take one hit. I call them one-hit wonders. And uh, the Vondertan took on a hit. Now the CP player did very well because this guy has to break off. Let's just rearrange the line and we'll make a decision whether one side wants to break off or not. And this is a situation after we've rearranged the line. What you do is move up your ships to fill the gap. So, the CP player has some decisions here, whether she would stick around for another round. She'd be rolling, uh, what, 12 dice, and the EP would be rolling 9, 13 dice. 
so pretty even battle. Um, but the defense factors of the Germans are pretty good, so I'm going to risk staying another round. Let's see what happens after all the ships have fired. Well, that's the situation after the second battle round, and indeed it was brutal. The Queen Mary got sunk, she takes the plunge, and the Vondertan was sunk. And, uh, yeah, let's rearrange the battle lines and see if the battle wants to continue. This is really risky. The CP player really should retire. Um, but she'd be rolling nine dice against the EP's uh, ten dice. So it's still very equal. The CP could still win this battle. Now, against my better judgment, I'm going to fight another round. Because if the CP are not driven from the uh, battle, uh, they do get two victory points for the raid. So let's see what happens after this third round. It could get very ugly, depending on the dice, which can be very fickle in this game. Okay, that's the condition after the third round. Um, Der Flinger took some hits, and uh, the EP player took some hits too. But the CP player was not driven from the battle, so they are going to get two victory points. Now, after the raid, um, ships return home, but the CP player still gets his two points. Okay, after the raid, what you do is put damaged ships back in the home country, and the rest of the ships can rejoin their squadrons. Now, remember the Dogger Bank still has the fourth squadron, so the EP is going to get a, a point for that, lessening the effectiveness of the raid. So we still have the submarine and U-boat combat to resolve. U-boats will attack in the North Sea, merchant shipping. The U-boat here could attack the Centurion, which would be kind of pointless. The most she can do would uh, inflict one hit on her, which would um, send the Centurion home. And actually, well, she would control the area and get three points. But that's like a one in six chance. I think she's better off attacking the merchant shipping. And in the Baltic, uh, the British submarine could attack ships of the second squadron. So I'll resolve those and we'll see how the victory points lie. Okay, the U-boats did very well on that turn. They gained four points total. Um, they got some in the Eastern Mediterranean and the North Sea. And whoops, now I got one more roll to roll for. Forgot the North Sea. Okay. Seven becomes a nine, which means that yikes. The uh, CP player got six points in um, merchants that turn. So that's going to help them a lot. They'll go from six plus four to ten. They're doing very well. Now we have to evaluate now the victory points for the rest of the board and see where that marker really lies. By the way, the British submarine in the Baltic. Did, uh, did not roll a six against the second squadron. So let's see where the victory points lie. Okay, that was a profitable turn for the EP player. They got eight points, and the CP player only got one point here for the Heligoland Bite, because nobody controls the Baltic. And uh, yeah, so we moved the marker down eight for the eight that the EP got. And the CP player got one point, so it's at three. And you can see the EP is now beginning to make headway against the German Empire there. Okay, after the points are awarded, all ships return to their home ports. Submarines back to Great Britain, second squadron back, third, first back. Squadrons back to England. Bella Rufon can go back into the fourth squadron. Centurion can go back to the second squadron. U boats go home. Indomitable returns to Gibraltar. 
the flexible back to Malta, U-boats back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, invincible back to Malta, and everybody's back home again. So the CP player is up three points at the end of turn two. So I'll end the video there. We're going to try to do just one turn at a time. And I may not uh, shoot the whole game. What I might do is do turns maybe two, three, and four by myself, shoot them, give you a summary, because the video will be too long that way. But uh, you'll get an idea, or I hope you've got an idea overall how the game works. But as the numbers begin to tell, the EP is going to bring horrible numbers to bear against the CP, as it was in real life. So the CP player, in order to win the game, really has to get ahead of the game by gaining in um, VP if she's expected to win. But like I said, the dice is very fickle, and the merchant shipping table can garner a lot of points. So we'll end this video, and that's the end of turn two of the playtest for Kaiser's Fleet, 1914. Thank you for watching.